Well, welcome back to the poster session, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. So I'm very excited to introduce a session where we're going to have 15 um, honours, HDR and ECR members. We're going to be doing three minute presentations for us. Um, the presenters can stay online in the chat function and if the audience has any comments or questions that they'd like answered, this can happen via the chat. Um, just for the presenters at two and a half minutes, we'll have a bell tone that will serve as a warning um, of 30 seconds left to wrap up. So I'm really excited to introduce our first speaker, Marshall Dalton, who will be talking on anatomical connectivity in the hippocampus. Thank you, Marshall. Hello, can you see my screen? Yes, that's great, great. thanks. Okay, great. All right, um, thank you um, for inviting us to talk today. Um, so my name is Marshall. I am a postdoc in Fernando Calamante's lab at the Brain and Mind Center. And this project focuses on the anatomical connectivity of the human hippocampus, which is located deep in the medial temporal lobes. And it's really central to a broad range of cog cognitive functions, including episodic memory. So track tracing data from rodent and non-human primate studies has shown that specific cortical areas connect with different regions along the anterior posterior axis of the hippocampus. But we know very little about these patterns in the human brain. So the aim of this study was to address this gap by adapting a diffusion weighted imaging tractography pipeline to assess where within the human hippocampus different cortical brain areas preferentially connect. And to do this, we used high quality data from the Human Connectome Project and for each participant, we manually segmented the whole hippocampus to ensure anatomical accuracy. And we used anatomically constrained tractography to generate 70 million tracks across the whole brain and an additional 10 million tracks seeding from the hippocampus itself. And importantly, we developed a tractography pipeline that was specifically tailored to track streamlines into the hippocampus and quantitatively measure the location and density of streamline endpoints using track density imaging. So in essence, this allowed us to visualize the spatial distribution and density of hippocampal endpoints associated with each cortical area. So using this method, we first identified the most highly connected cortical areas, and these were located in temporal, parietal, and occipital lobes. We then created endpoint density maps for each of these areas. And for example, at the single participant level, um, for each cortical area, in this case, area TF, we isolated streamlines with an endpoint in the hippocampus, and then the associated endpoint density map allowed us to visualize where within the hippocampus this cortical area preferentially connects. We then calculated group level distribution maps of endpoint density for each cortical area. And these maps are really quite striking in that they reveal where specific cortical areas preferentially connect within the hippocampus. So for example, areas in the anterior temporal cortex displayed high endpoint density in circumscribed regions of the anterior hippocampus, while in contrast, specific areas in the medial parietal lobe displayed high endpoint density in the posterior medial hippocampus. So overall, our method uh, represents a major advance in our ability to map the anatomical connectivity of the human hippocampus in vivo and in our understanding of the neural architecture that underpins hippocampal dependent memory systems in the human brain. And importantly, um, the method can potentially be harnessed to measure disease related changes in connectivity between the hippocampus and cortical areas known to be affected by neurodegenerative uh, disorders. So thank you for listening and please contact me if you'd like more information on this project. Great. Thanks, um, thanks, Marshall. I'm not sure who's got their alarm on. Um, uh, if someone's got their alarm on, it'd be great if they could turn it off. Okay, so um, while we wait for um, that alarm to go off, let's move on now to Dr. Uh, Mariano Cabezas, who is also going to be presenting. Um, from the neuroimaging team, so. Hey, hello everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to briefly present the key aspects that our team at SNAC uh, used for the segmentation of new, new lesions and multiple sclerosis patients on the MSX challenge 
that was held in this year's Mikai. So to briefly introduce some context on the problem, this is a heavily imbalanced problem in the sense that uh, new lesions are a really small part of the brain. So most of the brain is as uh, stable in these patients. And it's not uncommon to have difference in contrast between baseline and follow-up imaging, which is difficult the task of automatically segmenting these new lesions. So in order to solve these problems or to tackle these problems, what we did is base our, our proposal on the current state of the art network, a deep learning network that it's called UNED. So this is uh, the proposal with it. So the network is called UNED because it has a U-like shape. The left side of the UNED is what it's usually called the encoder because it extracts features at different resolutions for the images. While the right side is what it's usually called the decoder because it combines these uh, features at different, at different resolutions to produce the final segmentation. Yeah, this network is usually, if you have more than one images, what it's usually done is you combine them, you pass them through the network, and that's the final prediction. The problem here is that after the first convolutional block, these images are combined together and you cannot separate them. So in order to solve this and try to extract general features that are independent of the imaging protocol, what we did is use the same encoder, but with shared weights, but use it independently for the baseline and follow-up imaging. So as you can see here, now we have features from both images that we need to combine. And to combine these features, what we decided to use is these blue dots here, which is the dual attention gate that you see at the bottom. Briefly, it's called attention gate because we are focusing the attention of the network using a gating or weighting mechanism. And to briefly explain this block here, we have three main parts. The first part is uh, mapping all the baseline and follow-up features to a common space. The second part here is the part that takes these features and computes the correlation. And the idea here is that high correlation, a high absolute value of correlation meets high similarity, which is what we want to weigh down because these are parts that are stable. And finally, with this weighting, we apply it to this last part here, which is the features that are computed from the subtraction between the features on the follow-up and the baseline. So this is our proposal. Then during the training phase, we were given 40 cases to train this network and to test our results. And you can see the results on this training phase here. UNET is just using a normal UNET where we just use the UNET and combine everything at the beginning. And proposal is our proposal where we combine all these different steps that I mentioned. As you can see, the results were better. But after this, we had to submit this proposal to the challenge. The organizers took this proposal and run it on the testing set. And after testing, the results were revealed during the challenge day. So in how did we perform on this challenge? So as you can see here, in terms of segmentation, we were the top three team. In terms of detection, which is not included in the poster, but it also, was also given during the challenge, we were top five. We were the fifth team on, on terms of detection. And for the rest of the measures, we were the top one of the top 10 teams from more than 13 uh, other teams. So this is a brief summary. If you have any doubts, don't hesitate to ask or contact me. And thanks very much for this opportunity again. Wonderful, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Simone Simonetti, who's gonna be talking about a novel measure in dementia. Did that work? Can you see my screen? Perfect, thank you. Pardon? That's perfect. Yeah, great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So this poster is really about exploring whether we can observe behavior and use these observations as a measure of motivation in dementia. Um, so for this particular study, participants were told that an experiment was running late and they'd have to wait in a waiting room um, with a bunch of stimuli around them. So there was food, drinks, puzzles, magazines and games and that type of thing. And unbeknownst to participants, uh, they were audio and video recorded. And we were really interested in seeing what kinds of behaviours participants engaged in whilst they were in the waiting room. Uh, and at present, I've watched about 57 out of the 72 recordings. And for each of those 57 recordings, I've identified the behaviours that participants were engaging in whilst they were in the waiting room. And for this poster, I presented just a small subsection of the results. Um, so there's only about six control participants 
uh, nine participants with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia and 11 participants with Alzheimer's disease. And I've also only presented about six out of the 17 behaviors that were identified. And these behaviors include eating, rapid looking, which is basically just quickly looking around the room, uh, being non-active or just not engaging in any activities, completing a puzzle such as um, Sudoku or a crossword, flipping through a book, and then also grooming. And grooming can include things like um, touching your face or picking lint off your clothes. So you'll see as well that the y-axis uh, indicates count, and that is basically just the average number of times that a behavior was engaged in. So for instance, if we look at grooming um, at the bottom right, you can see that the AD group engaged in, on average, more than about 40 counts of grooming whilst they were in the waiting room. Um, so even though at the moment we do have quite a small sample size, there are some differences that seem to be emerging across the groups. So for instance, overall, the BVFTD group is showing much more behavior than other groups. They seem to be jumping around from activity to activity, which could be symptomatic of a lack of motivation to stick to one activity. Um, and then the AD group is showing more puzzle and flipping behaviors. And typically what is happening here is um, a participant might pick up a puzzle book, start to complete a puzzle, then rapidly flip through a bunch of pages, start to complete another puzzle and so forth. So this sort of um, process of flipping between puzzle and flipping may indicate, again, a lack of motivation. Um, so this method of measuring motivation appears promising, but again, I just want to emphasize that these are preliminary results. I have a lot more to code, um, and we also have access to other data, such as duration, and then also uh, participant results from apathy scales, which can be correlated with the behavioral data. So there's definitely a lot more scope for the study. Thanks. Great, just in time. Thanks a lot, uh, Simone. So next we have Jordan Wim in to talk to us about anesthetic agents and EEG signals. So over to you, Jordan. There we go. You're seeing my screen? Yep, perfect. All right. So you're laying on a table, a mask is covering your mouth and you're counting down from 10, nine, eight. You begin to feel a little bit hazy, five, for you don't finish counting, you're unconscious, or so we think. To be conscious of the environment entails both bottom-up processes, how our reality, our physical reality informs perception, and top-down processes, how our prior beliefs affect what we perceive. While people appear unconscious during anesthesia, the extent to which that this process occurs at various depths of consciousness is still being discovered. Here, we've investigated the effects of various, various common anesthetic agents on the top-down processing of roving auditory signals. To do this, we applied the hierarchical Gaussian filter, which allows us to model the beliefs of an ideal observer regarding both transitional probabilities, the chances that one tone will follow another, and environmental volatility, how stable a tone sequence is. We then matched these model predictions to the electrophysiological data, EEG, recorded while people were awake under low doses of ketamine, high doses of dexmedetomidine, and clinically rated as unconscious from, their, from these drugs as well as propofol. By correlating EEG activity with the responses predicted of an ideal observer, we were able to examine how and if the brain is making and updating predictions in line with top-down processing of the uh, incoming auditory signal. While people were awake, we found a standard pattern of brain activity in which an early mismatch activity in the brain is more responsive to a change in tone than to the repeat of a tone. This is because the transition from a given tone to another is less likely than a repeat of that tone. Similarly, a change in environmental volatility, usually induced uh, by a change in tone, correlated with the mismatch activity as well. We also found a P3A component in which both a surprising transition and a higher than usual environmental volatility induced a stronger positive EEG response. When subjects were given a low dose uh, of ketamine, the mismatch negativity was shallower than otherwise, indicating a reduced sensitivity to changes in either tone or the environment. By contrast, when giving enough dexamethamidine to induce disconnection from the world, or subjects were clinically rated as deeply anesthetized, both the early mismatch negativity and the later P3A components disappeared, demonstrating a deeper separation between our experience and the, uh, of the subject and reality. When deeply sedated, people cease to make predictions about their surroundings. The, the pattern of differences here was remarkable given the various mechanisms, mechanisms of action of the drugs used, indicating a relatively stable pattern of activity associated with top-down processing while awake and a dissipation of its activity while unconscious. Thank you. 
Thank you for that, Jordan. Our next speaker will be Jennifer Taylor, who will be discussing post-operative delirium and the blood-brain barrier. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Taylor. I'm a postdoctoral uh, researcher working in the lab of Professor Robert Sanders in the Central Clinical School. I'm going to talk to you about our current work on delirium and the blood-brain barrier. Delirium is an acute and fluctuating state of confusion characterized by disturbances in memory, attention, cognition and consciousness. It's often associated with medical events like sepsis and surgery and can affect up to 50% of hospitalizations in those aged over 65. It's also been associated with increased mortality functional and cognitive decline. The blood-brain barrier is a physical and chemical interface between the central nervous system and other systems of the body, and blood-brain barrier permeability has been linked to cognitive decline in older adults. Case control studies have previously demonstrated an association between delirium and blood-brain barrier breakdown, but none have investigated a temporal change concomitant with an acute insult. So in this study, we analysed data collected from two ongoing cohort studies of perioperative delirium. We used the gold standard marker of blood-brain barrier permeability, CSF plasma albumin ratio, and confirmed these results with calcium binding protein plasma S100B a marker of astrocytic injury or activation. Now, CSF was only available for 11 complete cases due to convenience sampling, so it was important to corroborate our evidence with uh, plasma S100B in a larger sample. So as you can see in figure two here, plots A and B, there's a difference between those in red with delirium and those in blue without in these time courses of pre to post-operative days one to four, suggesting a breakdown in the blood-brain barrier. Plots C and D show a difference between groups in delirium incidence, and plots E and F show spearman correlations between these biomarkers and peak delirium severity. Mixed effects models also show that recovery of delirium severity is associated with reduced biomarkers, and plots GH on this figure confirm correlation with CSF interleukin-6, a known marker of central inflammation. Now, in figure three, we further correlated these biomarkers with blood loss as plasmin activation has been implicated in blood-brain barrier injury, as well as CSF IL-6 and lactate. And in plot F at the bottom right, you might note that CSF lactate also correlates with peak delirium severity and further linear regression demonstrated that plasma S100B was independently associated with surgical risk, cardiovascular surgery, blood loss and low blood pressure. So we think these findings suggest a linking hypothesis represented in a schematic at figure four. We propose that inflammation exacerbated by surgical blood loss may result in plasmin activation responsible for a temporal breakdown of the blood-brain barrier and central inflammation that elevates CSF lactate. Based on our prior animal work, we propose that CSF lactate may have an immunosuppressive protective role via prostaglandin D2. Not only does this link the two preeminent theories of delirium, the metabolic insufficiency hypothesis and the neuroinflammatory hypothesis, but it challenges dogma that CSF lactate is a marker of harm in delirium. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Jen. 